John Carlo, welcome. Hi. Thanks for uh, sitting down to talk with me. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's nice to be here. How are you? Uh, I'm doing well today. I feel good, um, healthy-ish. Got my leg issue, but it's uh, it's going better than it was, so I'm feeling good. That's good. I've been aware of you um, through YouTube, your DP work, your own podcast, mm. The Creative Gap. Uh, where are you based again? Where are you at? I'm in, I'm in New Jersey. Um, I just moved back to a town called Tom's River. Uh, New Jersey is kind of central where the shore is. Uh, the way I like to describe it is if you've ever seen the show Jersey Shore on MTV, I think it was. That's where I live. But I do not associate as that type of person. Um, even though people think I have like a resemblance of like Pauly D cause I have this like curly hair. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. But regardless, uh, I live in New Jersey. This is, this is where I grew up. This is where I was born and raised. And, uh, we just moved back to this area from, uh, Cherry Hill, which is another part of New Jersey closer to Philadelphia. That's rad. That's rad. What's it like, uh, living in a small town, doing the work that you do? You know, do you ever mm -hmm. consider you know, being a DP, wanting to move to a bigger city like New York or LA? And uh, if not, why not? Yeah, I think that's something that I've always uh, questioned about where I live. It's always been something that's been in my mind. Um, when I first started being a DP, uh, the reason I chose Philadelphia, and this was the first time I actually moved out of my mom's house, was moving to Philadelphia. This was three and a half years ago, I think. Because uh, my mentor at the time, Danny Gewertz, he had a very strong connection in the Philadelphia market. And I started making connections there. And uh, when I decided to take the leap and move out of my mom's house, I just moved to Philly because I knew a lot of people there already at that point. And um, I started working in Philly for a while. And, uh, you know, I started building my name up as a DP and trying to get myself to be uh, a prominent DP in that market. Um, there's like that saying, do you want to be a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? And that's kind of how mm -hmm. I felt about my decision making. Yeah. And uh, I felt Philly was the right place for me to get my feet wet and propel me to like a certain place quicker than potentially, you know, New York or LA would have been. Um, and I also just really love the people that I was working with in Philly too. And, um, yeah, I guess, you know, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, now, back to central New Jersey where I'm halfway to Philly, halfway to New York. Um, I think I've done a decent job so far of building myself up as a DP uh, nationally to the point where I'm traveling all over the country to be able to work and I'm not necessarily uh, bound to a specific location per se. Even though a lot of the work I do is in Philly, um, I do travel quite a bit so it feels good to be able to be building uh, myself up to the place where I'm not super location dependent. When did you decide you wanted to be a DP? You know, what made you think that you could do it at the level that you want to do it? And was there like this one moment where you're like, oh, I feel like I'm actually working on, on a high level now and mm. I'm enjoying it. I think the first time I held the camera, I was 19 or 20. Um, so about five years ago. And I, I started just doing like regular videography, event coverage, real estate videos. And I mentioned Danny before as being a, my mentor at a particular time in my life. Um, and at this point in his life, he wasn't really solely doing YouTube. He was a full-time freelance cinematographer in the Philadelphia market. And he brought me onto a lot of projects that he was working on, commercials and documentaries. And I got to see what that role looked like in real life. Because uh, not growing up in the film scene, I didn't really know anything about film. I didn't know there were different positions. I just, you know, I, I was you know, blind to all of that. And when I started holding a camera, I was just the one man band videographer that was just shooting whatever for the sake of shooting, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but once I, I started to find that I was, you know, something was missing in doing that. I just didn't feel like insanely fulfilled. I enjoyed it, but something was still missing. And once I saw him do what he was doing and like seeing that you could make images look better with like lighting, lighting was such a huge turning point for me to be able to see that you could have like a really true artistic expression when you're shooting something in front of the, like whatever's in front of the lens. Um, so seeing him work was the true, I think, uh, moment that defined when I wanted to be a DP. Um, and then ever since then, I just became 
obsessed with trying to become the best DP I possibly could. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I don't know if, you know, I think where I am now, I'm proud of what I have accomplished this far in my career in you know, a short amount of time. Um, but I think a lot of it, you know, has to do with just how dedicated I was at the earlier stages of my career when I wanted to be a DP. I was also simultaneously starting a YouTube channel, you know, hand in hand, starting a DP, starting a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my beginning videos were essentially just me practicing DP stuff, like trying new lighting techniques, trying to figure out what a DP even was. So like working, you know, in tandem with each other, uh, you know, forcing myself to practice also helped me create content for YouTube. So I think the amount of practicing that I did really helped me uh, just, you know, fine tune a lot of fundamentals uh, of being a DP that I have, you know, I think strong instincts for now. Yeah. Well, you kind of answered one of my next questions and it's like, sweet, you know, you, you seem to have this, um, affinity for YouTube and I know mm. as a DP, you know, that is a, that could be a full-time job. So, you know, what makes you want to be a DP, do a project and then essentially go and, uh, produce a whole nother project of that project around it, you know, it must be important to you that this, this YouTube journey. Yeah, it's it's so brutal. It's so brutal doing what YouTube. Do you mean, I'm not gonna, it's like the hardest thing I've I still do to this day. Like being consistent with YouTube and like creating high quality videos that are still impactful while also simultaneously mm -hmm. DPing full time, traveling and trying to balance other things is it's a lot. Um but I think what keeps me motivated to um continually do YouTube at the level that I, uh, I try to try to accomplish is uh, part discipline. I think I have a really good um, me like measure of discipline in my life that things that I want to accomplish, um, I know that there are no real like uh, excuses not to accomplish certain things. So like YouTube and certain goals that I have, um, I think I'm disciplined enough to know that even when I don't want to do something, I have to do it. Um, which I think falls into a lot of aspects of my life. Um, but also, uh, I, I've seen what it really does, um, like the impact that some of these videos are making mm. for certain people. Um, yeah, sure. The first couple comments that I got, you know, that I really saw a big difference of like how it's impacted people and, you know, how that's, you know, maybe changed their life because not all my videos are tech gear reviews. A lot of it is I, I try to implement life, uh, not life advice because you know, who am I to give advice, but more of like my life experience and like mm. sharing that with people. And hopefully uh, my goal is always to uh, make people feel like they're not alone in whatever they're going through and find some relatability between my life and other people's life. Cause it's easy to look up to somebody that you think is, you know, doing the best work and you aspire to be them. And if they don't share any of the negatives of their life or share any of the, um, you know, you know, problems or whatever the case may be, you know, you think right. their life is perfect and you feel so distant from them. And I think that was something I wanted to, uh, kind of bridge the gap was that I'm not a perfect human. I don't have everything figured out and I still go through the same problems everyone does. Um, and I think seeing how people related to that helps me stay motivated to continue to share those types of messages. Dude, I think that's what got me at least looking at your stuff because um i certainly know and most filmmakers know especially the ones that have consume youtube they know what it's like to want to work at a high level but not be there yet and there's a, there's there's a space in between right right and uh to watch you have the humility like you do these like 45 minute videos where it's just you have a microphone on and you walk around set and yeah. it reminds me of like the the, the movie b-roll where it literally okay. like there's no one talking it's just clips of behind the scenes stuff right <laughs> i mean it takes some uh it takes some balls to kind of just let the world look in on your on your set as you do stuff and i and i find that admirable <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I don't even know if I think about it that much, like other than I know that there's a huge disconnect from people that want to work on like, you know, quote unquote, real film sets to people actually being able to experience it 
a lot of people will never get to actually experience what it's like to work on a set with people, collaborators, mm. gaffers, key grips, ACs. Because a lot of people are, they feel stuck in the one man band world. So being able to like create mm. a raw behind the scenes, a real life experience where you get to see the conversations, you get to see the collaborations, you get to see the disagreements, you get to see all of that is like a, for me, a true definition of like a real onset experience without being there. Dude, I, I mean, I can tell you, I I was that one man band for a long time. Mm. And I liked what I was making, like I was making good stuff. But there were limitations. And for some reason, I would like consume, 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 and wonder why my stuff didn't look like, like what I wanted it to look like. And then right. I, um, I decided like, hey, why don't I put down the camera and just get on set. Mm. And then I PA'd for a bit. And I found myself on set and I see like, oh, the person making the decisions creatively um, with the actor and the talent isn't the same person holding the camera. And I saw this team aspect and then I fell in love with that. And mm-hmm. it's it's so funny because like the filmmaker I am now, even when I am like directing something, John Carlo, it's like most of the work that I'm doing is just for me to get on set and work with other mm-hmm. people. You know right. what I mean? All the pitching, all the writing, all the you know, the pre-production, all, even the edit, it's just like, I want to get this stuff done and done well so that I can get myself back on set with my homies or with new homies or with, with these, just, it's the energy of it for me that makes me just return to this, this medium. And I don't know what that says about me as a creator, but I mean, do you relate to that? Yeah, for sure. It's like one of my favorite places in the world. When I when I wake up in the morning and I know that I'm driving to a set where I'm going to be greeted by, you know, crew that I'm familiar with and friendly faces and like, it's one of my favorite feelings driving to, it could be two o'clock in the morning and I am just so <laughs> it excited. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <sighs> uh, it's literally my favorite place. I really, truly love being on set with people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like, part of it's the shorthand, part of it's the, I know that my people have me, you know? Mm, Like, mm. I actually get, I get kind of stressed out when I feel like I have to be there, even as a director. If I have to, if if everyone's relying on me in order to get this thing done, that's like a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure I don't want, Sure. you know? I've thought about it, like, what if I'm in a car accident or I'm sick, I can't make it? Who am I, you know, usually it's my DP, or someone, someone that I know on set that knows me well enough that could take the take it and, and run with it, and that I'm telling you, that's a great feeling. Right, mm. it's a great feeling. Yeah, it's interesting. You know. mm. Yeah, I I think the pressure of a director is interesting that I don't really think about often. Is you know all of the, you know commercials. I get brought onto a commercial at a particular point in the process. Directors are you know a part of the process significantly earlier than me, so. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think, and you also, most directors that I know aren't on set nearly as much as I am. So like the, the few experiences that you are on set throughout the year, whatever it is, it, it has to be such a great feeling to be able to like actually be back on set after months of prep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I get you and I differ in that way. I, um, I thought I wanted to be a DP, you know, just because I love set that much. And then Mm -hmm. I realized like that there's a lot of technical, a lot of technicalities there that I, that aren't, that aren't my favorite part of the process, you know? Um, I mean, what's your interaction like with the director? And what do you mm. think of that? I think, blanket statement here, my role as a DP in the relationship with the director changes every time I work with the director, depending on who that person is. I think it's my job to be flexible in my approach depending on who that person is and what their approach is. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's something recent. Uh, I'm working on a short film coming up with a director that I've never worked with before, and she's based in a different country. So one of the first things that we talked about on a meeting was not necessarily all about the, what we were shooting and all that, but just like getting to know each other as a person first, I think is so important. And like some of my closest friends on in the film world are directors because we get so close on like a personal human level because you guys are, you know, director, DP, right hand man, like your sidekicks, essentially you have to be able, the director needs to be able to trust the DP to such an extent 
because of how much pressure the director usually faces on set. And Mm -hmm. if you're not, if you're not close on a personal level, when things get tough, you know, timelines get tight, things go wrong. That's when your relationship starts to diminish a little bit. But if you have a tight human personal connection, I feel like you have a stronger bond to withstand those moments. Yeah. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do when you're working with a director and maybe despite your best efforts, the connection isn't there and it's more transactional. It's more, you know, the hierarchy comes into play. I mean, what's your, yeah. What's your approach to that? I think I'm fortunate that I haven't had too many experiences like that. Most of the directors that I work with, I've had pleasant experiences with, but I think if it was in the commercial world, I can see it being, you know, okay being transactional because at the end of the day, we're just selling a product. We're not, you know, 50, 50, 50 days on set telling a narrative story, whatever. So I think in that case, if I had to think of what I would do, I I would just do the best job that I possibly could, you know, and not necessarily argue. Like there's no need to argue if you have disagreements. Like at the end of the day, the director is there to serve the client's vision and my job is to serve the director's vision so instead of arguing just get the job done do it the best you can and move on because you can't i don't know i believe you can't think of every single project you do as like your make it or break it project there are some projects out there that are just Mm. like one-off things like i don't know that's what i think sometimes to you what's the most difficult part of your job as a dp what like what do you struggle with the most Um, I think I struggle with believing that I'm like capable of doing a certain job as I'm scaling to new heights as a DP. Um, I think leadership is something that I've actually been really good at and something I think that is like naturally, I don't know, born into me. I think that I'm a pretty good leader regardless of how many people I am, you know, working with. So that is never really an issue. And I know that's an issue for a lot of people growing up is growing into uh, their role as a DP is, you know, leading a team. Um, I think for me, it's just understanding the scaling of being a DP and um, believing that my vision and like what I believe I can do is actually, you know, like possible. I, I think sometimes I second guess myself. Or I'm like, oh, that thought came to my head. It would be a great idea, but maybe it's, maybe that's just not even possible. I'm just going to disregard that. Um, yeah. So maybe it's just trying to figure out how to believe in my ideas more and be more confident within those. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm creating the best when I feel the best about myself. Yeah, I feel the same. Like I have been literally like incapacitated by myself on set Mm. before where it's like i don't know if this happened to you but i've been surrounded by like amazing ingredients the location my team uh, we have we have the the perfect anamorphic lenses the talent is good Uh, the weather was great but i'm in a mode in my brain where i literally can't combine those things in a way that i know i i I should be able Mm. to you know i don't know if you ever it's maybe it's the equivalent of writer's block But because it's set and because there's like time is of the essence, every dollar is put into every second. I don't know. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever gotten like stage fright on set where it's like, maybe it's not even just the pressure, but it's like you feel like you're not creating at your your most potential. I, I do feel that there have been like instances where I've had such a strong vision of what the like image is going to look like in my head. And then when it comes time to like doing it and seeing it, it's just like not right. And there have been moments where I'm like, I don't really know how to fix this yet. Like, I don't, mm. I don't think I'm at the point where I know what's wrong with the image or like how to accomplish it the way that I have, you know, seen it in my head. And I think over the course of, uh, as I've grown, I think I've gotten to the place where I can recognize what is wrong in an image and how to fix it. Um, But those have been moments where I just didn't know how to fix a problem that I, uh, I saw or just couldn't match what was in my head to reality or like the expectations that were set. 
All right, last question about this, and then we'll just stop beating ourselves up. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, yeah, it's good. We uh, we all make mistakes in the field. Some of them yeah. are like, some of them are big. Some of them are like, okay, this is the the whole production is going to feel this one. You know, Ooh. are you going to ask what, me about a mistake? I, I don't. I don't even need to hear specifics, but I, I just want to hear what do you do. When that like feeling in your brain goes, oh, this this whole thing could be screwed up because of me. All right, I have a perfect example. If you'd love to hear a story, um, yeah, tell tell me a story. This is the place to tell stories. Right. So <laughs> it was a couple months ago, and I was shooting a short film up in Buffalo, New York, and this is with a director and producer that I've worked with for like three years now. So I've I've I have a super close relationship with them. And this was their biggest project. This was my biggest project working with them. And um, it was a huge scene. I think there were like 30 or 40 extras inside of a church. Big moment wow. that we were shooting. And we had a yeah. Sony Venice, um, my Venice, which was, that's actually a strong note. It was my Venice. So my Venice means my responsibility. Yeah. We had that on uh, Steadicam and time crunch. Like we... Already, before we started the day, we knew that this day was going to be insanely tight and probably going to go in overtime. We shoot yeah. the first scene. It went great. Shoot the second scene. It went great. Third scene comes up. This is the big one where we're inside the church, all the extras. For some mm -hmm. reason, I don't know why we didn't dump the cards. No idea why. We shot two scenes already. Just dump the cards, save them. But something happened where... The Steadicam flipped it to low mode. So it was normal mode, and then he flipped it to low mode because we were doing a low tracking shot. Right. And as soon as he flipped it into low mode, the camera just died, just shut off. No idea how, no idea why. And I see my monitor go dead, and I see my AC running over to the camera, checking it out. The second AC is there, Steadicam's there. And they're working on it for like, you know, two minutes. And normally when something goes wrong, you hear the ACs be like, hey, just give me like two minutes. He said, yeah. hey, give me 15 minutes. 15. 15. Yeah, as, soon as, I, as soon as I heard him say, hey, we need 15 minutes, I knew something was immediately <laughs> You don't want to hear that from your AC. You no. You don't want to hear that. Especially because we were already getting behind. So I go up mm -hmm. to him. I'm like, so what's going on? He said, so the camera just shut off for some reason. It just died. It lost all power. And when we turned it back on, we got a notice that the card was corrupted and that it asked us to format the card. I forget the, what it, whatever it said. So we took out the card and we brought it to the DIT station where all the media is. And right. there's no files on the card. Everything we shot in the morning is gone. We lost everything. Everything is gone. And at that moment... Wow. I felt my heart, I felt my stomach, I felt every part of me just like sink and just... It's a physical feeling, that one. It is it? so physical. It's so mental. Yeah. It just, you literally feel the weight of the world on your chest. And not only because I was the DP, but also because it's my Venice. I have responsibility. Yeah. I take ownership of the things that go wrong or right with that camera. And right. uh, at this point, the director doesn't know what's really happening yet. He's kind of just like, you know, talking to the extras, talking to the actors. And finally, I talk to him about what's going on. And I'm sure you can imagine the reaction wasn't great, but it was calm. You know, he obviously isn't going to freak out in front of everyone. I didn't freak right. out in front of everyone. But uh, I think this is like a perfect example of, uh, I think we both managed our stress levels in a way that we still you know i think it showed a little bit obvious to the people that knew what was going on but we still had to get a job done and we still had to finish the day and uh you know we put a new card in we shot the rest and it's still my job to be able to direct the steady cam make sure the lighting's good make sure everything's good for the whole scene and then once we finished that we broke for lunch me, the director, producer, first AD, uh, sat down and tried to figure out how are we going to reshoot this entire morning. Mm. And uh, we ended up figuring it out and it ended up almost, it ended up being better than what we did in the morning. And even though we wow. did go into, we did go into overtime and we had to figure out some of that logistical stuff. Right. Um, it was just a moment of realization for extras. us. 
Yeah. Well, extra. that we shot. That we shot. The morning stuff was, okay, was the more minimal. The yeah. more minimal. It was more minimal. Oh, well, that's good. Thank God. Yeah. But we had our lighting. We had our lighting plans. Like we we shot everything already, so we knew how we wanted it to look. Yeah. Um, but we just had to get over the thing of like feeling bad for ourselves and questioning like why this, why that, and just like how do we fix it, problem solve, and do it right now. That's the key, isn't it, though, man? Where it's that is, like that's the job is problem solving. It's, with it's it's problem solving, but it's problem solving, yeah, under pressure, but under right. the pressure of that you, we put on ourselves, especially when we mess up. Because I know, mm. like I've messed up or made a mistake, and the weight of that is is so heavy, I almost can't perform through it. I yeah I'm like, I, yeah you know I'm, I'm like handicapped trying to make even harder decisions now. Because of like how, you know, so I think like having that ability to push through um, yeah. is a tough one. You've been it's able to do that. so tough. I just realized immediately like my role in this production as a DP is one of like a leadership role. And like when you commit to doing that, you have to understand that there are people that are looking up to you to like guide them and uh, put them in a certain state of mind to continue the job in a certain way. And if you are not, yeah. if you are not matching that energy, matching that vibe, those people are going to follow suit. And yeah. that is just not what you should be, uh, you know, promoting for yourself as a leader on set. And it's a tough job. That's why not a lot of people are directors. Not a lot of people are DPs at the highest level because it is one of the hardest jobs to deal with emotionally. Let's switch gears. Um, happy, happy talks. <laughs> let's, yeah, let's raise the let's raise the mood up a little bit. Um, what do you need to feel prepared to walk on set? Like mm. I know, and maybe like as a director, there's there are things I need in order to be able to show up to feel good, like that I can make these hard decisions that I need to make in the time that they need to be made. What is that for you? Um, I think overall, yeah, again, it's project dependent of what the complexity of things are, but it's having a crew that I believe is able to accomplish what we need, regardless of, uh, not regardless, but depending on the com complexity. Like if it's a very simple shoot, you know, mm -hmm. there's, I don't need to know that I have the best gaffer in the world that deals with, you know, 18 Ks all the time. Like it, it's okay if, you know, it's, uh, someone that is new or learning the gaffer role. But if I'm on a project where I have 18K or, you know, bigger HMIs and bigger, more complex issues, I need to know that I have a gaffer that is experienced in that role that could handle that and also lead his, you know, electric team to be able to accomplish what we need. Same thing with the gripping as well. And like, I think overall, just have a crew that I feel is capable of accomplishing and that I could trust and uh, that understands what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the way that I communicate with them in pre-production. Um, if we create lighting plans, uh, being on the tech scout together, I always try to make sure my gaffer and key grip are on tech scouts. Uh, it's, it's brutal mm -hmm. when they're not able to make it or their budget doesn't allow it because there's so many things that they think about that, you know, goes over my head when they're at a location. Like sometimes I forget about load in, like what does load in look like? for this big truck. Sometimes I forget about simple things like that yeah. or power, like electricity, power source, all those different things. It's great to have people that are focusing on their specific job to ensure that those small details that I don't necessarily should be thinking, I shouldn't be thinking about, they have it all covered. So it's like understanding that they have the small details figured out and they feel good about it. So we can worry about the bigger and more complex and even more creative, uh, questions. Um, but I guess in terms of feeling good outside of crew, I think it's knowing that um, the director and I have had, you know, good conversations about what he or she wants for the project, commercial, feature, short, whatever it is. Um, and that we just have enough conversations that we align equally. And um, I just, yeah, I, I think it's important to have them, the director, trust me in what I can bring to the table just as equally as, um, you know, I trust them in being able to make decisions for, you know, the overall project uh, in a whole as well. Yeah. What do you think, um, 
What do you think gets you selected as a DP? What do you think mm, um, makes good you? Question. What What do you think makes you an attractive hire to a director? From what I've heard from people is that I bring a very po- positive, very calm energy to all the sets that I work on. There's like no real stress that I um, exude. Is that the word? I think exude. Yeah. Um, yeah. That tracks. Um, that, that, tr- that tracks pretty good. What gets you riled uh, up? <laughs> uh, what gets me riled up? I have so many things that I'm just not going to say. Um, but uh, I th- yeah, just know that like there are moments on set that I am so riled up, but I just don't show it at all. Yeah. Um, that, that definitely but, seems to be a strong suit of yours. Yeah. Um, but there are definitely moments like in the car on the way home. I like sometimes break down and let all the emotions come out on the way home sometimes. Um, <laughs> you, you, you reserve it for that ride home? Yeah, I think, I don't think that's like a bad thing necessarily, but. No, I don't um, think so. I, I think it shows control. Yeah, I think the other thing that I've heard recently, uh, you know, some, some people have told me as to why they've hired me is because they're looking for a, a fresh young perspective from the cinematography style that they're accustomed to. Um, so I think maybe the work that I have been producing lately, uh, you know, shows that I can be this fresh perspective to maybe, a potentially more stale, uh, creative that they have experienced. Yeah. Well, let's get into that because, you know, most filmmakers hate this question, you know, when, when you start talking about your style, like, like, what is that? Oh boy. What is that? I'm not going to, actually, I don't want to know because... (laughs) Who are we to know our own style? I think that's for other people to decide, right? Mm. But I think, you know, where we pull our inspiration from uh, has a lot to do with what our tendencies are. Mm. Uh, Where do you get yours? What are you you watching? What, What are you pulling from? What, what, what do you think influences your, your decision making creatively the most? On a good day, I think on a good day, meaning like I'm feeling good. I'm like, you know, busy. I'm not super, you know, potentially anxious about things. I love looking at other DPs work. Um, I think it's really like, I, I gain a lot of inspiration from DPs, um, that I look Mm -hmm. up to and a lot of gaffers as well. Like on the lighting side, there's a lot of gaffers that I, that I follow that are like, so, in love with just lighting that they dedicate their entire life to lighting and what they're able to accomplish is so inspiring to think about how, you know, they're able to translate, you know, the DP's vision and make it just so much better. Um, but I also, I I am still so guilty of just scouring Vimeo. Like I am still a big believer in like the deep portals and the, of Vimeo. Like I'll find someone that I like on Vimeo I'll go to their likes, see what they like. I'll go to that person, dig into their likes. Like, it's literally just like a rabbit hole. I feel like that's how you find the good stuff in Vimeo is just digging into people's like likes and followers and following. Um, And I'll do that for like a couple hours and I'll just be 30 people deep and I'll be at the center core of Vimeo (laughs) and find some like amazing, amazing, like low key stuff. Dude, Vimeo is still strong. I mean, look, it's so good. A lot. A lot, a lot of people are frustrated with how much they've changed their platform. It's like, what are you guys trying to be? I, I don't care. I sift through it. I use it every day. You know, I yeah, think it's, it's, great. it's been a long-standing community of inspiration. I like that you get into the deep recesses of it, though, because I think you're oh, right. Oh yeah, it's the best. They're, That's how you do it. Yeah. You can't just you can't just look at the Vimeo staff <laughs> picks. Like, right. if I have a director right. that I like, I'll go on their page. I'll see who they're following. I'll click on their stuff. I'll see who they're following, click on their stuff. And I'll do that 15 times till I'm so deep into Vimeo. I actually don't even know what time it is anymore. (laughs) I love that. I love that. Um, AI, what do you think? Oh, jeez. Does its ever-growing capabilities inspire you or not? I think I'm battling with this internally every day. Because I don't want to be that grumpy old guy 
that doesn't accept new technology for the sake of it being like out of fear. Like I, I could see myself being that person. I know a lot of people, most people are that person. They don't want to accept it because they're fearful of what it is. Um, mm-hmm. But there's also a part of me that wants to explore what it could be. Like I, I got a message the other day from some random person and he said, what is your view on AI and do you think it's going to wipe out everybody in the video world? I didn't respond because I'm like, how am I going to answer your question? Yeah. yeah um, but I don't, I don't know if it's going to wipe everyone out. Sure. It's going to, you know, take place of certain jobs and functions, but I think my role of a DP and at the root, what a DP is, I don't think is going to go away because there's always going to be a need for somebody to make an image look a certain way regardless of what that format is, that's what I think I'm trying to get myself to truly believe, honestly, is like regardless of the format, there's always going to be a role for a DP to be in that space. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Do I truly believe that yet? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't doesn't scare me. I think there will always be the desire for the human element in, uh, in, in this medium. You know, I think... I like to consider it a tool mm. um, and I hope that it stays a tool and doesn't become a medium of its own. And if it does, that's fine. You know, genres have existed in film since the beginning of, of film. And, you know, if, if the old way of doing things with a camera and real talent is a genre of filmmaking for the future, then so be it. It's, a, it's definitely a genre that I'll be a part of. You know, I just think about why I do what I do as a filmmaker and it has nothing to do with, you know, typing in prompts. Um, you know, it has everything to do with, with being on set, like we talked Mm -hmm. about and trying to tell a story with people that you like. I agree. Yeah, for sure. I always think there's going to be room for a human element. And I think the more that we drift away from that, there's going to be an even more need for it. Mm. In my opinion. Yeah. Do you ever feel pressure to adapt to a specific style or a way of working? Yeah, for sure. I think part of being in the commercial space is like, especially on lower budget stuff, I wouldn't say that you're necessarily always there for your creative visions. I think a lot of the time, especially in the beginning you are, I don't want to say that you're another tool to be able to accomplish it, but I felt that a lot. And I still feel that today on a lot of projects is like, they're not hiring me necessarily because they like the way that I express myself creatively, like uh, visually. They're hiring me because I can get the job done. I get it done well, and I can accomplish the vision up to a certain point that they're happy with. And I think that's something that I've started questioning about my own approach to projects like that is when I recognize that that is a project that I'm currently in, how much effort do I put into making that project five to 10% better? Or do I just consider this a paycheck job and do what I can to make it look to the standard that they want? And I think that's just something that I'm trying to work through and trying to figure out what that what that really looks like. And I think it depends on the project. But um, I think there's always a way, even if you're only asked to do, you know, the bare minimum of something and just get the job done, there's always a way to add 5% extra of something to put your own little touch to, you know, something that could be so mundane. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. There seems to be a trajectory that we all aim for based off of our experience, our age, the projects we've worked on. What is that trajectory for you? And uh, where do you think you are at within that right now? And what do you think you need in order to get get to the next level as a, as a young, talented filmmaker that you are? Um... I think my overall goal uh, is 
I think revolving around the three major things that I do, the first being the biggest DP work, two, YouTube, three, podcasting. All three of those things that I do are for me to create something that I don't necessarily have to uh, work, like DP work, for the sake of money or sake of have to. DPing is like what I envisioned for my life forever. Like that is what I want my life to look like. That's the job that I love truly. But I want to create other other businesses, other forms of income, other things where I have more freedom to say no to, it might sound counterintuitive, but to say no to more DP work, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And be able to say yes to things that I want to. And I think that's the dream for every DP um, is to say yes to, you know, the only most creative projects in the world, whatever. Um, But I'm trying to build systems now at my age and where I am to be able to put myself in that position now. Um, But in terms of DPing, I, I definitely got, you know, the bug of feature filmmaking when I shot, I think I'm sick. A uh, feature I did a year and a half, two years yeah, ago. Yeah, I wanted I think to ask you now. about that. Yeah, I got the bug shooting that, and uh, I, I've i done a bunch of shorts. I have my first short film in Europe next month coming up, uh, so wow. trying to do some more of that. Um, I think the way that my commercial career is growing is, I think, at a pretty good pace where I'm slowly graduating into higher-end stuff and not just being like, tossed into this huge thing where I I may actually not be capable of doing that thing. So I think my growth is actually at a pretty um, linear, potentially linear path for commercial, which feels good and comforting knowing that I'm growing into that phase. Um, I would love to do uh, shows like Ozark is my biggest inspiration for a dream show one day. Um mm. Yeah, I'm but sure. I think something that I don't know is essential for me or it is, is trying to figure out if an agent or a rep is something that would uh, help me in this upcoming, you know, I feel like I'm almost, you know, crossing a new bridge into my career. I think I'm like almost hitting a new step and I'm not there yet. I'm almost there and I'm just wondering yeah. what that looks like with or without an agent because i know a lot of dps that i aspire to create work that everyone has an agent and um i don't yet i've had some conversations but i am just not yeah. sure what that looks like yet for me we'll put the link in the description but talk to me about the feature that you mm. shot i think i'm sick it look i mean the trailer looks awesome it looks great you know nice. what made you say yes to to something as big as a, uh, you know as big of a job as a feature Right. Do you know the background story to this feature at all or no? No, I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, I won't go into like an insane amount of detail, but sure. I was actually the replacement DP to the original DP that was brought onto that feature. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah. How's, yeah. how's that's that actually, feel? That's actually happened like three times since that project. <laughs> like a DP has gotten sick or a DP has gotten fired and I've gotten brought on as a replacement. So apparently I'm like the replacement guy. Uh, which I don't, it's not a bad, it's not like not a bad thing actually is like being the person that if something goes wrong, I'm the person that people call to fix the problem. Like I, it doesn't feel like yeah. a bad thing, but yeah. regardless. Oh, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can also like just look at the experience that you've gotten. It doesn't always matter like how you got it. You still got yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, I got brought on to that project. I think it was three or four days after they started production. So the DP, uh, you know, left after three or four days and mm-hmm. uh danny called me at like 9 p.m at night and he you know explained the situation asked me if i would just come and help him uh not even be a dp just the camera team left he was a dp at a time so he was just going to direct and shoot the whole feature i was like sure i'll come i'll come help you but in the back of my head i don't know if i ever told him but i was like i know that i'm going to dp this project a hundred percent I know it. Like, I just need to get on set. I need to show that, like, I am... Because he... I think at this point, he still thought of me as, like, his apprentice. 
that didn't mm. really know anything about cinematography because from the time that he moved from Philly to Hawaii, from Hawaii back to Philly was about a year and a half time span. So in that, yeah. he hasn't seen me in person. He's only seen <laughs> glimpses. So he, he, he still kind of thought of me as like his, my, his apprentice. Um, right. But I knew how much I've grown in that time. Right. Um, so I just came on set the first day, uh, was helping him first AC, just build the camera, make sure everything was good. I was also kind of giving some tips on how to light certain things if he was asking and just, you know, just subliminally just helping as much as I could and making the image look great. And then I think it was the second day um, I was operating on a scene. And then the next scene after that, he just pulled me to the side and asked if I wanted to DP the entirety of the rest of the project. And wow. immediately I was like, yes. Um, but I didn't have any, it was a unique, unique project because I didn't have any pre-production going into a feature. I just got thrown, in, got thrown into it and was, you know, dealt the cards that was given to me by the other DP and the equipment and everything. Right. And, um, I just had to adapt as quickly as possible. And so he gave you like uh, a trial day. Yeah. And I think that trial day went well. Um, and, yeah, um, yeah, every day after set, once I, once I became the DP after set, after 12 hours of shooting him and I would hop on the phone and just talk about the next day for like an hour, two hours at night. And yeah. we would arrive on set an hour, hour and a half before everybody walked through the day. So like we were working double time to just to be able for me to catch up to what was even going on. Um, yeah, but it all worked out. It looks amazing. Have you seen it yet? I've seen it. I can't even count how many times I've seen it. Um, it's so good. Yeah, you like it? It's crazy to think that this is my first feature because it's for a lot of DPs and directors, their first feature is like, it's like a cringy movie sometimes. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to say that sometimes you go watch your friend's movie or a film and it's like kind of cringy. It's like awkward. It's like student film-ish. Like they all, they yeah. have that vibe sometimes, but this is like a legit, this is like a legitimate movie that I am so proud of and would feel uh, like, I encourage all my friends, family to go see it because that's how proud I am of, it literally is a freaking wow. movie. Like it's a movie and everyone is like, yeah. yeah, of course it's a movie, dude. Like, I'm like, but no, you don't understand. Like for the first yeah. time shooting a feature, it could have gone so wrong, but it yeah. works so well. And to see it in a theater is pretty crazy too. Multiple times with like packed out theaters, sold out theaters like multiple times is a crazy feeling. It's so cool. Wow. It's a very unique first feature experience that n nobody really ever gets. And I feel so grateful to have had this experience. Are you looking, are you looking for the next one or do you, do you, you know, obviously yeah. there's like these there's like these three categories. There's music videos, commercials, and narrative. Documentaries in there too, right? But is I there don't one do as many docs that... anymore. No? Is, is there I... one of those that inspires you the most right now in this season? Mm. I think it's a healthy balance between commercial and narrative. Because um, commercials right now for me, like the commercials that I've been doing have been really inspiring because a lot of them have been so like creatively fulfilling in the sense that I've been given a lot of creative freedom to like fully express myself on these commercials, which is so rare. And I, it's almost like I turned a corner in a sense, like I'm in this new path of commercial world where I'm actually able to like do things that I picture in my head. So that is, that's been really exciting for me. And in terms of narrative, the short that I shot in Buffalo was an amazing experience, a great story that I was able to shoot. And the one that I'm doing next month um, is another really great opportunity to shoot in Europe um, and with a director that's so passionate about this story and a crew that's based in Europe and just a bunch of different things that I've never done before that I'm so excited for. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Who do you, um, who do you create for at the end of the day? Be honest. To get a deep answer here. I'll get the deepest answer. I, I'll give you the, yeah. Um, I think the reason why I, I'm not going to limit it to just like create, but like the reason why I do what I do and as much as I do 
DP, YouTube, podcasting, just, you know, creating and business equally because business is just as important to me as being a creative, um, is a hundred percent family and like my future family. Um, I, I'm in a unique position that I found my significant other in high school when we were sophomores in high school. We started dating wow. then. So it's been about 10 years now that I've been with her. She's the only person uh, I've ever been with. I'm the only person that she's ever been with, um, which wow. is insane, which is insane. That's insane. Um, and uh, yeah, I found my person and uh, we, wow. t- we talk extensively about what our life looks like in the future, what our goals and aspirations are um, outside of filmmaking and business and finance and all those things. So uh, I think everything I do now, all the time I spend on work and things that I sacrifice is truly because I see a really great future for her and I want, and I want to be able to put us in that position um, as early as we can. So when we have kids, I mean, I'm 25 now, so hopefully when we have kids, we said maybe 30, um, we'll be in a really good spot to uh, be parents that are there and, um, yeah, just set our lives up in a good way. So I think that's, it's really for our life, me and her and our future family. That's definitely something I find interesting about you. One thing I, I like about you is that you have these motives, other motives in your life that have nothing to do with filmmaking. And that's not always the case. And, you know, that ebbs and flows for some people, but you seem to have a pretty clear vision of what you want outside of filmmaking. You know, do you think that helps you with your filmmaking? I think it does. Um, But I also wonder too, it's like you look at all, you know, some big DPs in it, all they have in their life is filmmaking. So it's like to get to that top level, is that all that your life has to be is filmmaking? So I, I always wonder that, but <laughs> I, yeah. you know, I think that's a, you know, a million dollar question that a lot of people quite like, you know, want to know because filmmaking isn't necessarily conducive to having a healthy family life. Um, mm. But because she has been with me, from the beginning of everything that I've done from, you know, starting in music, being a music producer, I DJed, I had a clothing company and everything that I've done, she's been with me. So she understands how complex I, I think sometimes and like my way of doing things. And she is so supportive to the fact of like, she, she doesn't even question the fact that I'm going to Europe for three weeks next month. Like it's tough. But if I were to just like meet somebody now, I think that is a that is something that people struggle with is like, am I going to lose this person because they don't understand what I do? And if I say no to this job, yeah, I might, you know, keep this relationship, but then I lose this job or I lose this work and I might not. I think it's I, relationships is really tough, I think, in this industry. And I just yeah, I think that I, I have found a partner that understands the mission of what we're trying to do and understands the sacrifice that she also has yeah, to make. That's huge. And right. and I'm at the stage even in my life, man, where it's like, what do I want to leave behind in my, exactly. in my life? Do I want to leave behind like a body of work that, that, you know, a portion of the world enjoyed while I was alive and maybe a little beyond? Or do I want to, you know, create but beyond myself in a way that has nothing to do with, with my art, you know? Right. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's it's something that I'm wrestling with right now, personally. And I look at someone like you, having what you have and doing what you're doing at the level that you're doing it. I just find it inspiring. Thanks. Um, yeah, I just feel very I feel very lucky. The uh, position that I'm in and what I've been, uh, you know, given in my life, and a lot of it has been, you know, I wasn't I wasn't given anything growing up like in that sense, like I had to work for everything that I had. And like, I just feel, I just feel blessed of what I have in my life. I really do. I know that it's very rare uh, to have all of these things. Um, Like it's it's just not a lot of people get to experience this. And I I recognize that unique position that I'm in and I don't take it for granted. That's great. I think that's, I think that's the best way to go about it. So John Carlo, I want to end with this. The next person I'm speaking to is a director. 
what question do you as a DP have for them? I guess as a director, from my perspective, I'm curious to know what they see in working with DPs. Like, why do they choose certain DPs over others? And um, what attributes do they see in like, or what commonalities do they see in DPs that they like to work with? That's good. Um, you'll get their answer <laughs> eventually. Cool. Yeah, I'll be on the lookout for that. You have to let me know if they answer it. Uh, thanks so much for this. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.